When we're thinking about bush rangers in New South Wales, two men will obviously come to mind. That would be Ben Hall and Frank Gardner. But there were many other men that would take to the roads in that time. This is a list of just some of them, but on that list is a man that seems to have faded into historical obscurity. But he had a really large part to play in both Ben Hall and Frank Gardner's reputations. His nickname was Happy Jack, and he earned that by working up at Narellan Station, and the other stockmen always saw him uh, working, singing, whistling, and a very happy disposition, so Happy Jack it was. But he was also well regarded as a horseman and a stockman. But Happy Jack had a much darker side that was going to emerge very shortly. This man was John Gilbert. Now, John Gilbert apparently had committed more crimes in New South Wales than any other criminal to this very day. It's way over 600. And between 1862 and 1865, he was either indirectly or indirectly involved in the number of murders that were committed by bushrangers. So he was a reckless and dangerous criminal. But he was not always well regarded by his other bushrangers. John Vane considered John Gilbert to be a coward. But John Gilbert also had another interesting side to him. He would disguise himself and dress up as a woman to avoid capture by the police, and he does that when he escapes to New Zealand with his brother. But John Gilbert will be brought to justice by the police from the Bynalong Police Station, and behind me is the old Bynalong Courthouse, where the old Bynalong Police Station once stood. And in 1865, they will bring John Gilbert to justice. But where does John Gilbert's story really begin? Well, it begins down in Victoria at Williamstown in 1852. John Gilbert arrives here in the colony in October of 1852 aboard the Revenue. The Revenue has arrived from Ontario in Canada, where John Gilbert was actually born. If you look at the Max Ships Manifest when they arrive, he arrives here with his father and his stepmother, his older sister Eleanor, who's not much younger than his stepmom, his oldest brothers Francis and James, and his younger brothers Charles and Nicholas. Now Charles is only three, worth keeping that in mind as the story unfolds. But these uh, seaports are pretty rough and pretty disgusting, so they don't stay here for very long. They'll go through to Melbourne where they'll live in a tent city near St Kilda. And there's thousands of people living in tents there. But John Gilbert's father is very, very lucky. He gets a job as a pound keeper at the settlement of Buller, just on the outskirts of Melbourne. And the Gilberts actually go and live near there, and they are living where the Melbourne airport now stands. Now, John Gilbert's sister, Eleanor, actually meets a guy by the name of John Stafford on the revenue on the way out here. And in 1856, they get married and John Gilbert will join them up at Sugarloaf Creek. Sugarloaf Creek. And there's not much left to the old town now, but this is where John Gilbert would come and live between 1852 and 1856 because his elder sister has married John Stanford and they've come here and he's a pound operator. Skills that John Gilbert also learned from his father down in Melbourne when they first arrived in the colony. But one of the things that John Gilbert learns here is because there's a lot of horses here and a lot of horsework is the skills of a stockman. Now, Stanford resigns from here in August of 1856 and he moves on. And what happens to John Gilbert? Now, some say he goes to ovens round about Beechworth to the gold rush. But that doesn't make any sense because gold's actually discovered at Beechworth before the Gilberts ever arrived in the colony. So it's been going for six years, so it's hardly a gold rush. Others say he goes to Kyandra in New South Wales, in the Blue Mountains, and to the gold rush there. But the timing there's not right because gold's discovered here in 1859 and Gilbert leaves here in 1856, nearly 1857. So the timing there's definitely wrong. But we do know is that Gilbert turns up in New South Wales at a place called Narra Allen Station and Kenyu Station in the early part of 1858. And my bet is he's taken those new stockman skills and put them to good use. Around 1859, John Gilbert will turn up here near Moringo and he goes and works at Narra Allen and Kenyu Station, remembering that's where he gets his nickname, Happy Jack. 
Now, Moringa was a very important settlement in western New South Wales prior to the gold rush. But it's a good opportunity just to have a look at the geography and the timing and how things unfold over that short period of time. So you've got Gilbert here working on Rallon and Kenyu stations around Moringa. Just to the northeast, not very far from here, is a place called Reeds Flat. And there's a guy there to up by the name of William Fogg, and he's running a sly grog shanty. So no doubt, some of these young stockmen would have made their way down to Reeds Flat for the odd drink or two. January of 1860, Frank Gardner gets let out of Cockatoo Island, and he goes and looks up his old mate, William Fogg. Now remembering, John Frank Gardner stole some horses from Reeds Flat in 1854, and some will say, that he went and looked up William Fogg because he was in jail with William Fogg's son, who died of typhoid. But either way, he's at William Fogg's place in no time. January, sorry, June of 1860, gold's discovered at Burragong Station, just to the west of Moringo, a little place called Landing Flat, modern day young. So you can see things are not too far apart and pretty tempting for everybody to get involved. And that's exactly what happened. Enterprising Frank Gardner and William Fogg decided that these young miners might get a little bit hungry and they'll set up a butchery shop. In September of 1860, Lambie Flat, that's exactly what they do. But to feed these young miners and get these cows, they're going to need some help. So they approach Gilbert and O'Mealy and say, would you like to go around and be cattle buyers? Go around the local district and buy cattle for the butchery. Now you remember that gold rush caused a massive vacuum of stockmen and workers from all the stations in this area. So their technique was not to pay them in hope that if they owed them enough, they'd stay. But Gilbert, not going to take that easily, so he grabs a manager or ties him to a tree with a stock whip, forces a manager to sign a cheque and threatens him if it doesn't get cash, he's going to come back and shoot him. He takes the cheque into town, goes and gets cash, comes back, but Gilbert says from that day forth, he believes he's on the wrong side of the wall. So he's running around, very wary of the traps, thinking that he's a wanted man. But in the Police Gazette, there's no mention of this. It appears to us that then the manager at Morella never reported it. And the police and the traps had no idea who Gilbert was yet. But anyway, the butchery goes on until July of 1861, when Frank Gardner finds himself in a shootout with police at William Fogg's Sly Grog Shanty. And that's the end of butchering business at Landon Flat. So what happened to John Gilbert after that incident in 1861, July? Well, he could have been at Lambie Flat. There's some suggestion he was there. Some say he was up with Ben Hall, the Lachlan, or even at William Falk, gone back there. But there is common belief that John Gilbert's first highway robbery took place when he was working with Frank Gardner when they robbed a Mr. Hewitt and Mr. Horsington when they were making their way from Wombat to Lambing Flat and that happened not very far from here at all. But when you look at the Police Gazette and you look at the Trove, the newspaper article at the time, there's really nothing to suggest that John Gilbert was actually there. But there are another, a number of robberies that happen around the Marengo Lambing Flat area that do suit John Gilbert's description in that time period. So whilst it's not known which was his first robbery, he was definitely on the road committing highway robbery. The first real account of Gilbert working with Gardner, however, it turns up at Escort Rock at Yongar in June of 1862. So we definitely know they were working together at that stage. After that robbery, John Gilbert with his brother Charles and Henry Manns will hightail it down to Victoria. Now, on the way, they get as far as Tamora and they run into Frederick Pottinger. Now, Frederick Pottinger will try to arrest them. John Gilbert gets away, but Pottinger gets Charles Gilbert and Henry Manns, and while escorting him back to Forbes, John Gilbert's gone back, got help, and will come back and rescue his brother and Henry Manns from the police, and the Gilberts will hightail it down to Victoria now. They definitely want to get out of the state. Henry Manns will finish up heading across to Murrumburra where he gets caught and eventually hanged. If you want a lot of detail around what happened in, in that event, go to our other documentary called Myths and Legends on the Escort Robbery and we go into a bit more detail. But what we do know is in the later part of 1862, the Gilberts are in Victoria. The Gilberts go to Victoria 
and presumably they stay with their father at Lauriston for five or six weeks. Then they decide to go to New Zealand to the Otago Goldfield, get out of the colony, much safer. But John Gilbert dresses up as a woman in the company of his brother Charles. They're in the Otago for very, not very long when John Gilbert says that people started looking at him strangely while he's walking around the goldfields dressed as a woman and he decides to clear out and he goes to Queensland working on a farm. And everything's going all right but he gets suspicious that people are recognising him again. So he clears out and comes back to Marengo, bailing up people on the roads, back to his bad old ways. How do we know all this happened? Well, John Gilbert will actually tell a young lady a little while later, after that event, that he did go to New Zealand, he tried to go straight, he even dressed up as a woman in New Zealand, so he admits to doing that, and he says he went to Queensland working on a farm, trying to go straight, but people recognised him and he got scared and he came back to the colony, back to being a bushranger. It's also supported by his brother Charles, because Charles Giasi Gilbert will publish a letter in the paper after the fact proclaiming his innocence, saying that yes, he was arrested with, by Pottinger with Henry Manns, he was rescued by his brother John, they came down to the Colburn, stayed five or six weeks, went to New Zealand, fails to mention the fact that John's dressed up in a dress, and his brother John gets sick or unwell, clears out, he says he comes back to Australia, it's not New South Wales, but he wasn't sure when, where, so Queensland matches him with that story. But poor old Charles de Gilbert is arrested in Otago and sent back to Sydney by Melbourne to stand trial for being in suspicion of the escort robbery. But there's not enough evidence to send him to trial, so he's set free and back to Victoria he goes, where he put that letter and puts that letter in the paper. Now that all makes sense because in the Police Gazette, the younger brother of John Gilbert, Charles de a 20, 22-year-old boy, man, is uh, seen uh, described by Pottinger. So that fits in with the story and it all makes sense, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't, because go back to the ship's manifest. John Gilbert is 10. At the time of the escort robbery, he's 20. Perfect fit. Younger brother Charles is only 3 in 1852, so therefore he can only be 13. Well, that's hardly a description that would fit a 20 or 22-year-old man. So this man that's penned the letter or the person that's caught up with John Gilbert escort robbery doesn't seem to be the same Charles Giassi Gilbert on that manifest. We don't know who that man is, but we had a suspicion it might have been James Gilbert. But James Gilbert is six years older than John, so that doesn't fit the description of a 20 or 22 year old man either. But James Gilbert is wanted for stealing horses in December of 1862 in Victoria. He does turn up the Police Gazette in New South Wales because they believe his wife was living at Braidwood, so there's a bit of interest in James Gilbert. But when you go digging around in the Gilbert family, the mystery gets even deeper. So the map that was on screen is just a representation of some of the crimes that Gilbert and O'Malley will get up to when they first reappear. It's taken from the Police Gazette, these crimes, but there are other crimes that were committed as well. But it just gives you a bit of a feel for what they're up to. What they do is they raid the road from Moringa to Young, which was then Spring Creek, where there's gold diggings, and they actually even raid properties at Spring Creek. A few months later, in April of 1863, they're down at Cootamundra. Now, it's a fair way to go for no particular reason, but they rob Barnes' store. Then a month later, they're back again at Barnes' store. And it gets a bit suspicious about why this sudden interest in John Barnes and why the absence for a month. Maybe they'd went and retrieved something they'd hidden because it turns out that Barnes was most likely fencing gold and anything else the bushrangers had for a percentage of the take. Not a wise move by John Barnes. Then the gang move up, Gilbert and O'Malley move up here to Wombat, back to the gold diggings, and they start robbing from the miners. On this particular occasion, there's a guy by the name of McBride. Now, McBride is dressed in corded pants, long shiny Napoleon boots, and carrying a revolver. And he confronts Gilbert and O'Malley, and Gilbert will shoot him, mistaking him for a trooper. But typical, after a major incident like this, the gang will move away from the district, and they head down to Junee.
So after leaving Juni, there's a spate of crimes, but they really do pretty much head up to Kakor, where they actually look up a guy by the name of John Bain, because they're in a new district and they're looking for somebody who can acquire some good horses, and John Bain is certainly the man for the job. So John Bain joins the gang, and shortly after that, they'll hit the Kakor bank, and it's a complete botch. They get chased off by a bank teller and a single shot, and the gang will, gang will flee town. Um, and it's not long after that, Mickey Burke will join the gang, which is John Bain's real good mate, his best mate, and they flee down south, and they run into the police at a place called the Mondral Station, not very far from Murrumburra, and there's a shootout there, and they narrowly escape with their lives. So again, they flee further south, and it's back to Juni. And you start to wonder, is there somebody or something at Juni that's safe haven when things are pretty tight up north? So this is old June Eve, or what's left of it. Now, Gilbert makes it down here a couple of times. Why would he do that? Well, there's a report that Gilbert actually turned up here dressed as a woman. So maybe he came down here and hid. But that doesn't make any sense because there's also reports of Gilbert and O'Malley raiding properties in and around old June Eve. So that's hardly the actions of men that are trying to hide. Why didn't he go further south? Well, Gilbert's a smart man and he can read and write and he'd keep it on the newspapers because there's a bush ranger that's operating south of Wagga way more dangerous than John Gilbert, and that's Dan Morgan. And Gilbert's not gonna get tangled up with him. But he also knows that the police in Wagga are really stretched and trying to catch a Morgan. So he can come down here, get up to mischief, and not worry about the police too much. And his little plan works a treat because after he raids the property here at Old June End, the police are really seriously criticised for the lack of response. So that is probably why Gilbert only came down as far as Janine and no further, and he only came down a couple of times. But anyway, they'll head back north again, and John Barnes, he's the gang's on the move, and he's got his store at Murrumburra. But when he hears about this, he decides to head back to Cootamundra, and on the way, he runs into John O'Malley and John Gilbert, and John O'Malley will shoot John Barnes and kill him. Now, you have to think that maybe John Barnes wasn't going to share nicely, and the gang didn't particularly like his way of dividing up the proceeds and that was the result of his greed, maybe. And as I say, you're going to sleep with dogs, you're going to get fleas. But again, a major incident and the gang will flee up north to a place called Bathurst. And it's the first time that Ben Hall turns up with the gang. That we, that's really notable. And it's quite a famous uh, story in itself, the raid on Bathurst, and a major embarrassment for the police but it's a story worth just following up later on. But the gang will make a complete pest of themselves across the, the northern end of the western districts of the police area, raiding on properties and just getting up to all sorts of mischief. But it's a raid on Knightley's that Mickey Burke will be shot and killed by Mr. Knightley. Well, that's Mr. Knightley gets credit for this killing, but it's often thought that it was more likely that Mickey Burke was killed in the crossfire and was actually killed by one of his own mates. It deeply affects John Bain, and John Bain will surrender himself to a Catholic priest after a lot of pressure from his mum. And it's a really, really great and beautiful story, John Bain, and it's a story we'll do later on. But moving on, then they hear there's a family by the name of Campbells, and they live at Goimbla, not very far from Escort Rock, and they've been publicly stating their dislike for the gang. So the gang of three decide to go and pay the Campbells a visit. And Gilbert, Hall and O'Malley will go over to Gilwimbler and they will burn down their barn, try to steal some horses. And in the process, the Campbells will get into a shootout with Bush Rangers and shoot John O'Malley dead. And it's actually thought that it was Mrs. Campbell who did it. So just take a little sidestep on that story. John O'Malley is buried by the creek there at Gilwimbler by the police the next day. His father hears about it. He comes out from Goolagong in a cart digs up his son with, his, with John O'Malley's brother, put him in the back of a cart in the middle of summer, this is November, remember, and take him all the way back to Goolagong, and they bury him just outside the old Anglican church of Goolagong, such as a love for your son. But again, another major incident, and what are Hall and the Gilbert going to do? They flee out of the district, and they come through here, Moringo, down to Borowa, and then head on down to Bynalong. Well, it's getting on. But the watch reminds me of the story here. In a robbery that took place in December of 1863, 
and Gilbert and the Hall are just down to two in the gang. And then we're about five miles from Boorawa on the Bynalong Road. And the Boorawa Mail's coming past in the coach. And they go out and bail it up and they escort the coach a few hundred yards into the bush, which has long gone. And they start going rifling through the mail. Gilbert finds a letter edged in black. That letter usually would indicate that somebody was deceased in the family and there's a letter to somebody of that, mem of that family member. So Gilbert grabs this letter and puts it aside very carefully. Hall's going through the mail, as you can well imagine, and he finds a piece of wedding cake. And he must be thinking to himself, oh, yum, cake. But then he realises that it could be a trap and it could have been poison and they're trying to catch the bush rangers. So they're getting a bit paranoid, so Hall doesn't eat it. But they go through the mail and they come across a heap of checks because by 1863, everybody's getting a bit cunning that you're sending mail and then sending cash in the mail, it's not going to get there. So Hall gathers up all his checks and he says to everybody's left, is anybody willing to cash these for him? And there's a stunned silence amongst the little crowd. And so Hall says he's going to burn them all and they try to talk him out of it. They say, don't do that. You know, no one's going to benefit you by burning all these things, but he's so enraged that there's no real cash involved. But anyway, he doesn't burn them. The people that were on the coach ask Gilbert if they can leave because they're just standing around. And Gilbert says, yeah, go on, get, get lost, I need you here. So they disappear, obviously back to Borowa. But Mr. Hadley stays behind with the coach driver. And Hadley says to Gilbert, do you remember stealing a gold pocket watch off of Mr. Murphy? And Gilbert says, yeah, I remember stealing that. And he said, well, in actual fact, that belonged to Mrs. Scott from Borowa. And Mr. Murphy was escorting it back to her. And uh, Gilbert goes, well, he said, I would never have stolen it if I'd known it belonged to Mrs. Scott. And he says to Mr. Hadley, if you'd be so inclined, would you return it to Mrs. Scott on my behalf? And Mr. Hadley says, yes, he would take charge of the watch and return it to Mrs. Scott. So it gives you a bit of an insight into the fact that uh, Hadley says that Gilbert's got five or six of these things hanging around his neck. He knows which watch he's stolen from who, and he's able to hand it back. It's amazing that he actually knew who it was, but he was actually willing to hand it back to a Mr. Scott. Obviously, somebody he knew, or maybe as a seal from ladies, I don't know. A dray goes past as they're doing all this, and Gilbert says to Hall, can you go down to that dray and see if there's anything to drink on it? And Hall comes back, he says, no, there's nothing more than flour and an empty keg, which is, you know, pretty unfortunate. So Gilbert's in charge. He's telling Hall what to do, and according to Hadley, He's directing his questions to Gilbert as well. So Gilbert must be the man who's in charge at the time in December of 1863. The interesting thing is this is the second last robbery that takes place in this little time slot. And that is the last time we'll hear of John Gilbert for about 10 months. Ben Hall does go on and commit several more robberies over that period of time. And he teams up with a couple of other gentlemen to do those crimes up towards Falls. We are at the location where John Gilbert will shoot Sergeant Edmund Parry of the New South Wales Police Force and he was based in Gundagai. But what happened on that fateful day in November of 1864, it unfolded a bit like this. Gilbert, Hall and Dunn had been camped here all day and they'd been bailing up anybody who'd come along the Great Southern Road and they would relieve them of anything of value and camp them up on that hill. A policeman comes along at lunchtime and they disarm him and they camp him up on the hill with the rest of them. But why not let him go? Well, they didn't want these people going back to Yass or Gundagai to alert the traps that they were here because they were really waiting for the mail coach because it possibly had some cash on it. About three o'clock in the afternoon, coach turns up and it's making its way along the Great Southern Road heading north. Now, according to the people on the hill, it unfolds a bit like this. As the coach is approaching, there's two troopers riding rear guard. It's O'Neill and Parry. And when the bushrangers see them as well, they go, uh oh, that coach has got traps. So they proceed up that hill. Now everybody thinks they're gonna retreat, but halfway up the hill, somebody says, oh look, there's only two of them. And they turn around and they come back down the hill, firing their revolvers out of the saddle. Now it's an interesting point because somebody's giving orders and the rest of them are following. They're also willing 
to take on the traps. That's a bit risky, but they're getting desperate as time is pushing on because they need that cash and they're willing to have a go for it. As it come down, Paul and Dunn will go after O'Neill and Gilbert comes down after Parry. And he comes down to about this location. And they're circling around each other, shooting at each other. And according to the people on the hill, Gilbert orders Parry to stand. And Parry says, I'd rather die first. Gilbert must think to himself, suit yourself. And shoots Parry through the chest. Kills him outright. The gang will go back up to where the people are camped, gather up anything they needed, and will head north. Because typical, after any of these major altercations with the traps or a shooting, the gang move away from the area and they head north. We're here at Binda in New South Wales, and this is where uh, Gilbert Hall and Dunn will burn down Mr. Morrissey's store. But why were they here in the first place? Well, it turns out there was going to be a ball here at Binder, and by the Bush Telegraph, the Bush Rangers find out. And it wasn't the first time they've gate crashed a party. So they rock up here late in the afternoon on the 26th, they go into Morrissey's store, and they say to Morrissey, right, hand over all your cash, and we'll have the cash you've got hidden in that jar behind the counter. And Morrissey goes, how do they know that? But anyway, he hands over the cash, but the monk girls come in. And the monk girls are pretty friendly with the bush rangers, and they also work for Morrissey part-time in his store. And he's thinking to himself, I bet you those monk girls told the bush rangers where my cash is. Anyway, the bush rangers are going to round up the Morrisseys and the monk girls, and they're going to march them down to the hall where the ball has already started. And they lock the doors and windows, and they say to everybody, here's Morrissey's money, we're going to have a party, buy yourself some drinks, and let's have a good time, but no one's leaving. And the monk girls, again, are seen to be flirting with Gilbert and Dunn, and it's reported that they were messing with the monk girls' blouses. Very naughty, I think. Morrissey, all the time, is asking everybody else to give him a hand to either overpower the bush rangers or help him escape. But no one wants to be part of this because Parry has been shot a month earlier, and no one at the time really wanted to be the next person to be a fatality against John Gilbert or any of the gang. So no one's going to buy in to Morrissey's plan to try to escape. But Morrissey does escape. He eventually, during the course of the evening, gets away. And when Hall finds out, he's enraged. He rushes out of the hall, goes looking for Morrissey, realises he's gone for the traps or is hiding. And as an act of revenge, he decides to go back to his store and burn it down. So he goes back to the hall, grabs uh, Gilbert and Dunn and says, let's go and do this. Mrs. Morrissey finds out and she starts pleading with the bush ranger and says, oh, don't do that. Oh, you know, I'm a seamstress. I've got all these beautiful dresses in there. It's my only source of income. Don't burn down the store. But Paul's had none of it. He's burning everything down. So Gilbert takes upon himself to go inside the hall, uh, the, uh, the store, grab all the dresses, takes them, plants them under a tree out of harm's way. So what's going on here? Does Gilbert not agree with Hall at burning down the store? Does Gilbert have some sympathy for Mrs. Morrissey? Or is Gilbert just like one of these dresses? We don't know, but it's just kind of strange that Gilbert did that. They burn the store down, and then the bush rangers go back to the hall, say to everybody, we're leaving, don't follow us, or we'll shoot you, and they head north. But it doesn't end there for the monk girls, because during the course of burning down the store, everybody thinks or says that they were kind of enticing the bush rangers to do it, because Morrissey wasn't a very well-liked man. So Morrissey lays charges, sends the monk girls down to Goulburn to stand trial. But no one's going to get evidence, evidence against the monk girls because no one likes Morrissey. Morrissey's an ex-policeman and he's also been running up a bit of a credit amongst the locals here and they owe him money. But now his store's gone and the legend's gone, they don't owe him a cent. So they think to himself, well good riddance to Morrissey. And the monk girls get off. Morrissey leaves town, he joins a vigilante group looking to hunt bush rangers.
So what happens after the uh, ill-along coach robbery? Well, John Gilbert is thought to have developed typhus. So he goes into hiding for about 10 months. John, uh, Ben Hall, sorry, will head up to the Lachlan where he's most familiar, joins up with a couple of other fellows and will hit the roads on the Lachlan and becomes a bit of a nuisance for quite a while. Now, what is John Gilbert doing in that 10 months? Where's he hiding? A couple of theories. One, he goes down to Reed's flat and stays with the Fogs because he knew the Fogs pretty well. Some suggest he even worked for the Fox around 1860, and it's thought he had a relationship with one of his daughters. So that's one place he could have hit. But the other possibility is there's a number of sympathisers around Bynalong that would look after the bushrangers. And one of those men was John Kelly. But John Kelly was also the grandfather of John Dunn. Now when John Dunn gets in trouble with the law but not, uh, for not appearing in court, yes, he is, uh, next time he's seen, he's actually with John Gilbert. So it's thought that John Kelly, being grandfather to John Dunn, he may have been looking after John Gilbert, and now that John Gilbert's filling a hole, he better after his little bout of typhus, decides to hit the roads again, takes his young apprentice, 17 year old, John Dunn, the Ploughboy Bushranger he'll be known as, and the next time they're seen is up at Goldman on the Bradland Plains because they've joined up with Ben Hall again because one of Ben Hall's men's been caught, the other gave himself in, the poor old Ben Hall back to a gang of one. So the three get together and they hit the Great Southern Roads and they're after any coach they can get their hands on and they make a complete nuisance of themselves. They are really getting in the eyes, in the eye of the police force. It's in November of 1864 where they get into that altercation with Sergeant Parry and O'Neill and kill Parry. They go through Binder, back up the Forbes. Then by January of 1865, they're down at Collector, where John Dunn will shoot Samuel Nelson and seal his fate in the future. They go down by the middle of March, they're down at Araluan. And you can see they're really spreading out their area of operations because the intensity of the police is increasing phenomenally. So they've got to keep moving and move further and further afield. And they botch the attempt on the gold robbery at our lawn, you can't help thinking that they're trying to reproduce what happened up at Escort Rock. Now the money's gone, they want another crack at that sort of money. But it's a botch and they, like again, they know the traps are after them, so they flee all the way back up to Forbes and they hit Jones's store. It's in late March, a telegram appears from the police back to Central Police Station in Sydney that John Gilbert's being wounded. Now, in April of 1865, it's probably the last time the gang will be seen together. They're at Crowper Station, not very far from Forbes, and it's at that location they get a stool, a wooden stool, and the three men will have their names engraved in the stool. Now, the, people, the only two men that could have done that would either have been Gilbert or Dunn, because remember, Hall is illiterate. And if you go to the Forbes Museum, it's sitting there in a glass case, and it's a really beautiful little stool, and you can see their names engraved in it. But that's the last time probably the gang was together because Hall will go out to his mate Mick Connolly's place where he will be ambushed by a party of police led by Davidson on the morning of the 5th of May, 1865. Less than two weeks later, John Gilbert and John Dunn are down at John Kelly's place, again at Bynalong. And it's on the morning of the 13th of May, the police will surround the hut and there'll be an ambush where John Gilbert will be shot and killed by the police from Bynalong. But Gilbert walked from the open door in a confident style and rash. He heard at his side the rifles roar and he heard the bullets crash. But he laughed as he lifted his pistol hand and he fired at the rifle flash. Then out of the shadows a troop is aimed at his voice and pistol sound. With rifles flashes the darkness flamed, he staggered and spun around. They riddled his body with rifle balls as he laid on the blood soaked ground. There was never a stone at the sleeper's head. There's never a fence beside, and the wandering stock in the grave may tread, unnoticed and undenied. But the smallest child in the watershed can tell you how Gilbert died. <laughs>